Hello and welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's video is part of a series I do where I compare books with their movie adaptation. And before we get into the book and movie, I want to warn you that there will be spoilers for both, both the book and the movie. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, you should do that first and then come back and watch this video. I also want to tell you that this is available as a podcast. I will link to Spotify and Apple down below because those are the two most popular platforms, but I am on other platforms as well. So these tend to be about 30 minutes, but especially if they're longer and it works better for you to listen to it, that is available. And I also want to say that even though my podcast is called Why the Book Wins, <laughs> I do love movies as well. And there are times where the movie wins when comparing book first movie. So it is not always the book because I do love movies. And oftentimes, you know, before I even started this podcast, the reason I would read a book was because I liked the movie. And so I wanted to read the book for it. And so I love both essentially. And I think I give a fair, you know, view of both book and movie, despite my name being why the book wins. <laughs> anyway, thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, let's get right into the book first movie. Hello, and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura, and today we are here to talk about Sometimes a Great Notion, which is a novel by Ken Kesey published in 1964. And I have my first edition copy right here. And then the movie is directed by Paul Newman and was released in 1971. So when most people talk about Ken Kesey or when they think of Ken Kesey, they think of like psychedelic hallucinogenic drugs and the book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. At least that's what I thought of when I heard his name. And I only recently heard about Sometimes a Great Notion and it was his second book published just a couple years after Cuckoo's Nest. And this one like, is considered his better novel and it's considered, he considers it like his magnum opus and is the one he is most proud of. But it is the one most people don't think of because One Flower Over the Cuckoo's Nest has just been so much more popular through the years. And like I said, I had never heard of this and it wasn't until it was recommended to me through a subscriber named Charles. He commented on my video for HUD slash Horseman Pass By, which stars Paul Newman. And he recommended Sometimes a Great Notion because the movie not only stars Paul Newman as well, but Newman also directed the film. So thank you so much to Charles for bringing this book to my attention. I can't tell you how many times, I mean, I could try to think of how many times, but there's been a number of times where a subscriber or a follower suggests a book and movie for me to cover and I end up loving it so much. So I'm so grateful. I love it when people give me requests because oftentimes they're ones that weren't even on my radar. And so thanks to someone requesting it, I am able to read the book, see the movie and the majority of the time I end up loving it. <laughs> Power of the Dog is one that was requested. And then sometimes a great notion, which is fantastic. And the title comes from the song Good Night Irene by Lead Belly. The line is sometimes I live in the country, sometimes I live in the town, sometimes I have a great notion to jump in the river and drown. And now before we get into the details, I want to just give an overview of the Stamper family just to help keep it more organized. So we have Henry, who is the patriarch of the Stamper family. His whole oldest son is Hank. And then 12 years later, he had a second son when he remarried and his second son is named Leland slash Lee. And by the way, his second wife slash Lee's mom has committed suicide by the time the book starts. And then Hank has a cousin named Joe slash Joe Ben slash Joe B. He goes by all these names. And then we have Viv, who is Hank's wife. Also, one way that these characters just felt so real when you read the book is how they have all these nicknames for each other. For example, Joe Ben goes by all these other names like Joby and Joe. And then Hank also, like Joby, will call Hank Hankus. And so that's just a nickname he has. And so, yeah, this book, the characters were so fantastic and felt so real. Anyway, moving on to the summary. So this takes place in Oregon along the Wakandaaga River and the union loggers are going on strike. However, their strike isn't really making much of an impact because the Stamper family is non-union and they have their own logging company and they have agreed to fill the Wakanda Union or Wakanda Pacific contract. And so since they're filling the contract instead, the strike isn't doing anything. And so the whole town is angry at the Stampers because everybody's on strike and not getting paid and the town is kind of going into a recession because of this, all because the Stampers are filling the contract instead. And the Stampers hire their own relatives for this logging company. And so as the strike is going on, they just need more men to fill this contract. And so Joe gets Hank to write to Lee and tell him to come to Oregon and help them work as they fill this contract because Lee has moved to the East Coast. And so they write to him. And when he gets the letter, he decides that he will return. And he has multiple reasons for wanting to return. But a big one is that he wants to get revenge on Hank because Hank had been having sex with Lee's mom. And Lee has never forgiven Hank for that. 
And then we have Floyd Evenwright, who was in charge of the strike. And he brings in this guy from California named Jonathan Drager to like figure out the whole stamper business and help get that sorted out. And then at one point there is an accident which causes Henry to lose his arm and Joby dies. This leads Hank to cancel the contract. And so the town is happy because finally their strike is going to pay off. However, then after some other events, Hank decides like, no, I am gonna fill the contract. And so the book and movie end with Hank filling the contract to WP and the town is upset with him again. So that is just a very quick rundown of the story. And so for the book review, this book starts at the end when Hank goes back on his word and decides to fill the contract anyway. And as the book went along, it's like 650 pages, so it's a thick book. And so as it's going along, I kind of forgot about how it had started that way because I was just so engrossed in the story as it was being told. And so it wasn't until Henry loses his arm that I was like, oh yeah, the beginning of the book started with a severed arm. And so that was when I started to see how it was all being connected and all coming full circle basically. And I did listen to like the first half of this on Audible and I would highly suggest it. It was a great audiobook. I forget the name of the narrator, but he was amazing. And by the way, I do have an Audible affiliate link. So if you click that link down below, you get your first book for free and it also helps my channel out and any money I make through YouTube ads or through Audible, it just all goes back into covering the costs that it takes to create these videos. Anyway, highly recommend this audiobook. I did read like the second half, like I physically read it and I'm glad I did that too because it is an experience reading this book because there's so many lines and parentheses and italics and uh, uppercase dialogue and so just the way it was written. I liked experiencing it through audio, but then it was a great one to actually sit and read as well. And the audiobook surprisingly did not make me confused because this book jumps around so much. We switch from third person perspective to first person perspective, and then we jump back and forth in time and we're head hopping all over the place. The only other book that has done it quite to this extent is Beloved by Toni Morrison, which I loved. And Toni Morrison and Ken Kesey both do this so beautifully because someone who is not as talented or as skilled, this would just be a mess and so confusing. But because they are so skilled, it just is such a great way to read a book. Like I just love it how, you know, it's less organized. You know, it's not like one of those books that breaks perspectives into different chapters. It's just all over the place. And yeah, I loved it. And the story itself is very character driven. If you are familiar with my channel, you know that that is one of the most important things for me when it comes to reading a book is I need characters that I am intrigued by and well-rounded and that feel real. And like I said, we're in all of these people's perspectives, even the main character Characters, the side characters, as well as characters that like don't really play a part in the story. Like for example, we have Simone in the book. She's not in the movie, but she's a character in the book whose pers perspective we get. And I enjoyed reading her sections, but she never really tied into the story. So I, I didn't know why we get her story, but I enjoyed hearing it. And yeah, overall, I just love this book in case you can't tell. <laughs> Even like the events that happen, it's not like any of it was like jaw dropping and I wasn't like shocked by any of the events, but maybe that's also one of the reasons I liked it is because it felt more real and more natural maybe because it wasn't like this super over the top climactic moment. Instead, it was just like these more realistic events, I guess. So don't expect it to be necessarily like this overly emotional jaw dropping book as far as like plot twists or things happening you don't expect to happen. But I feel like saying that <laughs> doesn't do it justice though, because yeah, it's just an amazing story. So well written, amazing characters that feel so real. And I did enjoy where the story took us and the events that took place. It's just none of it was necessarily like shocking. Not that a book has to be shocking, but anyway. Moving on to the movie. So I kind of freaked out because I was looking for this movie on different streaming services and I could not find it until I thought to look on YouTube and it is available for free on YouTube, which as soon as I saw it, I think I remember hearing that it was available on YouTube. Anyway, so if you wanna watch this movie, it is on YouTube. The video quality is not the best. I do not have a DVD player, but this makes me wanna get a DVD player and get the DVD because this is such a great movie and the quality just isn't very good on YouTube. And if you're watching this as a YouTube video, I will be including clips and images. And so if they are blurry and not very good, it's because the movie itself, the quality just wasn't very good. So I therefore don't have the greatest quality images. Anyway, it is available for free though. And I would recommend you all check it out. And I will link to it in the description box below. But this was the second film Paul Newman ever directed. However, this one was not his choice. The original director dropped out and then they offered it to Paul Newman. And so he accepted and he did say that it was difficult to both 
act in the lead role plus direct. So he did a good job, but it doesn't sound like it was an experience he loved and he never did it again. Also, the book mentions Paul Newman, which I thought was funny as I was reading it. There's like some movie playing in town and it says that it stars Paul Newman. However, I was looking it up and the movie actually does not star Paul Newman. So I don't know if Ken Kesey got it wrong on purpose because we do hear about a character who works in the movie theater. So maybe that's an example of the character not being very good at his job because he's promoting a movie, but he is saying the wrong actor is in it. But I thought it was funny that they mentioned Paul Newman in the book and then Paul Newman ended up being in the movie and directing it. But yeah, I thought this movie was well done. I really like the scenes where it shows them working because like they describe these scenes pretty detailed in the book and I enjoyed it, but it's just another thing to see it actually happening and the size of the trees, which I mean, he talks about how big they are in the book, but <laughs> certain scenes I realized I was imagining trees being much smaller because then when you see it in the movie, you just realize how massive these trees are which I should have had a better idea about the size of these trees because we went to Seattle last summer and we did the coolest thing. It was a, like through Airbnb experiences where we were able to climb a Douglas fir. It was crazy high up. It was like one of the scariest things I've done, but also like one of the most unique and coolest experiences. And I highly recommend I might look up that Airbnb experience and link it down below as well, because if you're in the Seattle area, you should definitely do it. It was like, incredible. Anyway, there's a part in the book where he, Hank is talking to Lee about what it's like to be up at the top of those trees. And he can see that Lee just doesn't get it because you don't understand until you've been up there yourself. And so when he was talking about that part, it made me think of my experience when we like were like strapped in and going up the trees. But anyway, that was a side tangent. Basically these trees are huge. And so this book is long, like I said, and so there is just so much to it. And in this video, I will only be scratching the surface. And I read a review for the movie and someone talked about how like the book was unadaptable. And that's true to an extent because there just is so much to it. And so the movie can only capture so much. However, I do think the movie did a good job, you know, adapting a 650 page book and making it into a two hour movie. And also this is the first Ken Kesey adaptation. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest wasn't released until four years later. However, you know, Cuckoo's Nest has, is obviously much more popular and has, a, has had a staying power that Great Notion just wasn't able to achieve. And like, I get it uh, as far as the movies go, but yeah, I just think this is one book and movie, one that more people should be talking about, especially in conversation with Ken Kesey. Anyway, getting on to the, the changes between book and movie, I will start with Lee. So like I said in the summary, in the book, they write to Lee asking him to come out and to Oregon to help them with the work. Whereas in the movie, he just randomly shows up. And so they're all like, what are you doing here, Lee? So that wasn't the case in the book because they asked him to come out. And in the movie, he does tell Viv how he had tried to commit suicide by like turning the gas on and then lighting a joint and how the windows blew out, but then he himself didn't die. And we do get this like firsthand experience in the book where this happens and he has like burns on his face because of this. And as soon as that explosion happens, that's when the mailman comes and delivers the letter asking him to come to Oregon. And in the movie, we do see how he is there for vindictive reasons because he is talking to Hank and Viv about how when his mom died, he saw letters that Hank had written to her and it had included money apparently. And so he's kind of saying it as a way to make a point, I guess, like beating around the bush about why Hank was sending her money and writing to her. And then also we, in this conversation in the movie is when the wreath gets brought up because when she had died, Hank had a wreath set to her funeral. And in the movie, he says how there was no one at the funeral. And so, you know, it was nice of him to send a wreath, but he should have been there in person or something. Whereas in the book, Hank, again, he sends the wreath. However, Lee lies and he tells him that there were so many people at the funeral and there were so many wreaths and flowers that he didn't even notice Hank sent one. When in reality, he did notice because no one was there. And just throughout the book in particular, we see how Lee just misinterprets everything Hank does. Like the wreath, for example, he thought Hank sent this this wreath as a way to like stick it to Lee when really he was just being nice. <laughs> but Lee takes everything far too personal and is just has such a weird thing with Hank that he just doesn't think Hank is capable of doing something genuine. And so he just always interprets it wrong. And when he first arrives in Oregon, everybody is re being really nice to him. And initially it like puts him on guard being like, why are these people so nice to me? However, over time he begins to be like, wow, like 
I guess this isn't all that I thought it was. And he decides that he won't get revenge on Hank and decides to just enjoy it. But then he, even though he's not planning on going through with his revenge, he feels like he needs to tell someone what his revenge had been. And so he tries to talk to Viv about this. And then later, like they're interrupted. And then later that evening, they come back to the house and Hank and Lee talk about jazz music and then that conversation ends up leading to talk of Lee's mom and Lee just gets very on edge and very defensive whenever his mom comes up and so this causes Lee and Hank to get in an argument and Lee feels like he sees Hank's true colors and he decides to go through with his revenge after all. And another reason why Lee and Hank just have this animosity is not only because Lee misinterprets everything, but they just never talk about anything straight out. And so they just have all these pent up emotions and pent up feelings and they're not talking about it. They're not addressing it. And they're also not physically fighting. And so Hank, that bothers him too, is that they have this pent up aggression and if they don't have an outlet for it because they don't fight physically or verbally. However, in the end of the book, Lee gets his revenge and then he and Hank end up fighting, which I will get into those details later, but they end up getting in a physical fight and this kind of like cures things and makes them both feel better. So I'm not saying violence is the answer. However, it did help with their relationship. Whereas in the movie, they actually do talk specifically about Lee's mom and about Hank. And so that's a huge change right there because they're addressing it specifically. And Lee does have like pent up emotions and feels inferior to Hank in the movie, but it was definitely more of a theme and far more present in the book. And moving on to Hank, Hank did sort of remind me of HUD from the movie HUD, as well as Phil from The Power of the Dog. However, Hank is, you know, more likable, less selfish, not as heartless or mean as HUD and Phil. So they're similar in some ways, but he's definitely a much better person than HUD or Phil was. But Hank is just naturally very talented and skilled and he's smart and he excels in every physical activity and he's tough and not one to back down from a fight and he gives everything his all and he is very loyal to his family and he is well respected. And he is also very stubborn and is not a team player and is really just in it for himself and there's a scene where he's talking to Drager and Drager is being like you know these people are your friends and your neighbors and look what is happening because of your actions and Hank basically says that you know he's on his own side and he fights for himself essentially. And to talk more with like Lee and Hank's dynamic, again, Lee just feels so inferior to Hank, which makes sense because Hank is just like very talented and very strong and he seems great at everything and everybody loves him and he's very tough, similar to Henry. And Lee, it says how his greatest fear is appearing fearful. <laughs> and so there's times where he just like comes across as a wimp and even I was just kind of like, ah, like, come on, Lee. But then he has other times where things don't appear to bother him. For example, there is a part in the book where these people try to drown him because they find out he's a stamper. However, once Hank shows up, like they're all intimidated by Hank and they run away. And so Hank or Lee gets out of the water and he's just kind of being like, why didn't you help me? But then later he's just kind of seems to not be bothered anymore. And so Hank is impressed that the fact, at the fact that Lee is able to just brush things off apparently. And then to move on to Henry. So Henry's family moved to Oregon when Henry was a kid and his dad Jonas ended up painting it there and abandoning them. And there is a line from the book I want to share because it is just such great imagery talking about how Jonas feels about Oregon and it reads, for this land was permeated with dying. This bounteous land where plants grew overnight, where Jonas had watched a mushroom push from the carcass of a drowned beaver in a few gliding hours swell to the size of a hat. This bounteous land was saturated with moist and terrible dying. He was being smothered. He was being drowned. He felt him he might awake some foggy morn with moss covered over his eyes and one of those hellish toadstools sprouting in the midst of his own carcass. And years later, when Henry like is an adult with kids, he hears that Jonas has died. And so his body is sent to Oregon along with this plaque that Jonas had wanted sent and it has a scripture on it. But Hank paints over the scripture and then he writes, never give an inch over that because that is his life's motto. And he does live by this like quite literally, <laughs> including with their house. So we hear how the river just keeps rising. And so houses that had been built on the banks early on, like got swallowed up by the river. And so they've learned to build their houses away from the river. However, the Stamper home is right on the edge of the river and they refuse to move it. And so they just like have all these rigs going on with cables and sandbags and things and making it so their house does not have to move and they're gonna stay put. And the house is, you know, very symbolic of how, you know, it's so isolated out there, isolated from the rest of the town. And because it's right on the river, people have to take a boat to get to the Stamper. And that comes into play later. So people will be on the edge of the river and they ring a bell. And then someone from the Stamper home brings their boat over, picks the person up and takes them over to the Stamper home. 
But most of the events of this book take place when Henry is like in his 70s. And like I said, he had an accident. Or did I say this? He had an accident. So his arm and leg are in a cast and he's also just old. However, even though he's old, like physically, he is still just like, just a very lively person. And Henry Fonda plays Henry in the movie. And he was perfect. He really brought this character to life as just having like so much attitude and being witty and fun, but tough and stubborn. One thing in the book is that he'll often like go into town and get drunk and then come home. So that's just kind of how he spends his days in the book. However, that's not really shown in the movie. I mean, we do get one scene with him in a bar, but it was more frequent in the book. And in the movie, after he loses his arm, he dies like early soon after that. Whereas in the movie, he continues, or in the book, he continues to live for a while. And so that was just great too, how like his body is falling apart, but he was still just like this strong willed, person who didn't lose his spirit despite that. And it's not until he hears about Joe Ben and the WP contract when his, his health really starts to fade. But even by the end of the book, he's still not dead. They say he's close to dying, but he hasn't officially died. And like I said, his motto was never give an inch, never give a inch. And that was the original title for this movie, I guess. And if like the VHS tape, that is what it was released as on VHS. So it kind of has gone back and forth between the two titles, but never give an inch is, is a good title, but I prefer sometimes a great notion. And to talk about Joe Ben. So Joe Ben is such a fantastic character. And in the movie, he is played by Richard Jekyll and he was nominated for an Academy Award for his performance. And he really did capture just the lighthearted, kind, funny, hardworking character of Joe. And in a movie review, I saw someone call Joe Ben like dim-witted but kind, and I totally disagree. Joby was smart and insightful, and just because he was a genuine person without a mean bone in his body who was always positive, that doesn't make him dumb or dim-witted. You know, it's just like the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once teaches us, just because someone is always seeing the bright side, doesn't mean they do it because they're too dumb to see the negative, they do it because they choose to be positive. But anyway, at one point in the book, Hank is feeling down about everything, and Joe Ben starts talking about, you know, trying to lift his spirits, telling Hank how, you know, they can't fail and they got this. And he's just being very over the top and just, it says how Joe Ben isn't afraid to make a fool of himself and he doesn't, he's just being himself and very lively and how it inevitably gets Hank in a better mood because how can it not? And then there's also a part in the book where the townspeople are calling and just being rude to the Stamper family and Hank and Lee had been answering the phone and they're getting tired of it. And so Joe Ben offers, but then uh, Lee tells him that he doesn't know how to talk nice while actually telling a person to like screw themselves basically. And so he therefore isn't fit to take the calls because Joe Ben is just too, too genuine a person. And like I said, he is very insightful though. And he is observant and he sees what is happening with Viv, Lee and Hank. And so when Lee refuses to go to work, he doesn't want Lee staying home with Viv. And so he convinces, you know, like Lee and Viv and Hank to have Hank to have Lee go into town to see the doctor. That way he will be getting away from Viv. And when he's talking to Viv about this, she doesn't understand why he is being so insistent, but she says, or she's thinking how, even though she doesn't understand what his point is, she knows that Joby is so unselfish. And if he's being persistent about something, it's because, you know, it's for the benefit of others. So she always trusts him. And at one point near the end of the book, like the, the last quarter of the book or so, maybe earlier. Anyway, at some point in the book, I was just like, man, like Joby is such an amazing character. So I bet Ken Kesey is gonna kill him off because authors love to do that where they make you so attached and love a character. And then they're the ones that end up dying. And that is indeed what ended up happening. So in the book, this is a little different from book to movie. So in the book, Lee goes into town to see the doctor, as I said, because Joby convinces Viv to get Lee to go to the doctor. And Henry decides he wants to go to town too. So Henry and Lee both go into town. Lee goes to the doctor and Henry goes to the bar. And while they're there, Hank and Joby are out working, cutting trees. And then this other guy, Andy, is at the mill, like getting the trees that they like send down to the river, to the mill. Because at this point, all the other stampers have stopped showing up to work. So it's just... I mean, Lee, but Lee's too sick. So it's just Joby, Hank, and Andy. And so they're there filling the WP contract when then Hank drives up from town because he realizes that a flood is about to come in. And so he's like, you know what? We got to fill this contract like earlier, like today, because with this flood coming in, we're not going to make it if we wait. So we got to hustle and do it right now. And Hank is just so exhausted by everything. And so he doesn't really want to take the lead. And so Henry, showing his years of experience, takes the lead and tells them what they need to do. And they all work together to achieve this goal to hurry and fill the contract. And I love the quote that talks about this moment with them working. So I wanted to share it. 
Few words actually passed between them. They communicated with the unspoken language of labor toward a shared end, becoming more and more an efficient skill team as they worked their way across the steep slopes, becoming almost one man, one worker who knew his body and his skill and knew how to use them without waste or overlap. And like I said, Hank is mentally exhausted, but Joby is just loving this. <laughs> like he's loving the teamwork and he's loving like the high pressure and they have to fill this contract soon. And he's just really enjoying it. And I could relate to that because I love just working as a team to achieve something. And even when there's pressure and a time crunch, yeah, I just love that feeling. However, during this time, Hank ends up sawing a tree and the tree doesn't fall the way it's supposed to. And so as it's falling in the wrong direction, it gets Hank in the arm, sorry, it gets Henry in the arm, and then it rolls down and it gets Joby and it pins him in the river. And so he's not injured, but he's stuck in the river and he can't move. And in the movie, this plays out basically the same. The only difference being that Lee was there with them. And so Lee sees all of this happen. Hank goes down to be with Joby and Lee takes Henry into town to see the doctor. Whereas, like I said, Lee had him in there at all because he had been in town the whole day. But in both book and movie, Hank tries to saw the log so that they can get it off of Joby. However, the river is starting to rise and the log is so big that they can't saw through it without the saw and it's an electric saw. It's gonna get in the water and it doesn't work if it gets wet and so they can't saw the log. And then they're like, well, when the river rises, the rock log can roll off. However, because of how it's positioned, it's gonna roll like towards Joby, like towards his face rather than away. And so they're just really stuck in this bad position. And as the water continues to rise, eventually it rises so high that Joby's head is underwater. But Hank is like, you know what, don't worry. When the water gets that high, I can just give you mouth to mouth. So just hold your breath. And when you need a breath of fresh air, I'll you know stick my head in and give you mouth to mouth. But this is such like a precarious situation because in order to survive, Joby has to sit, stay so calm when his head is submerged underwater because otherwise he's gonna swallow the water and drown, which is ultimately what ends up happening. So despite Hank's best efforts, Joby does, does end up drowning. But I just love this moment in the book because it lasts for a while, like it takes a few hours for the river to rise. And so we just see the two of them hanging out and chatting and reminiscing and Joby is staying positive, his usual self. Yeah, it was just a great scene and so touching. And I love that Ken Kesey had just that intimacy of Hank having to give Joby mouth to mouth repeatedly. And yeah, I just really love the bond that they had. And people who watch this movie, chances are this is the scene that will have stuck with them because it is just so powerful. So to talk about Viv and Lee, so Lee's grand scheme to get revenge on Hank for having had sex with Lee's mom is to have sex with Viv. And this like is so annoying, but it's not a surprising tactic because I mean, it is psychological as we will see. And it really does like drive a wedge between Hank and Viv, obviously. and. Lee is being genuine to some extent because it seems like he really does fall in love with her, I guess. I don't know, it doesn't seem super genuine, but he makes it seem like he really does love her. Anyway, what's annoying about this, of course, is that Lee apparently sees women as property rather than their own individual people making their choices because he sees it as like men's property. Like his mom, he's very possessive of her and being like, wow, like Hank stole her from me. And then he is like, well, Viv belongs to Hank, so I'm going to have sex with her and that'll be my way of getting back to Hank. So it's just this very sexist way to see things, seeing women as objects and possessions instead. But I guess it's not surprising for the time since this was the 60s. And but I mean, honestly, there was a show from the 2000s that I was watching that had a very similar thing where like seeing women in this way and using women to get back at someone who did you wrong. And yeah, so it's annoying but moving on. So in the end of the movie, Lee says, after he's had sex with Viv and just everything, you know, everything that has happened, Lee says how he wishes he would see Hank splattered on a sidewalk the way his mom was. And then Hank replies like, you know, you should consider the fact that I was 14 at the time and your mom was 30. So who was banging who, as he says. So that was a really powerful moment from the movie that was not in the book. And it really makes you see it in a new light because I mean, in the book, it made it seem like Hank, he was in high school, but it made it seem like he was like later in high school. But regardless, he was much younger. So she definitely, she was taking advantage of him rather than him taking advantage of her. But the movie really punctuates that moment and that fact, the age difference, and you just see it in a whole new light. But when Lee 
has sex with Viv, it's different because in the movie, he was there and he saw what happened to Joby and he saw what happened to Henry. And after he drops Henry off at the doctor, he goes to the house and he sees Viv and she has packed up and she is going to leave Hank. And before she leaves, they have sex. And then he goes into town to see Henry and Hank again. And that was totally different because in the book, he had not been there and he did not know what had happened with Henry and Joby. He was just in town and then Henry never shows up to pick him up. So then he just walks back to the house. And when he shows up, Viv is there and he's like okay now's my chance but then he chickens out and he doesn't make a move and he's in his room and he's crying and she hears him crying so then she walks in and then she makes the move and they end up having sex and while they're in bed together lee thinks that they have plenty of time because like i said hank will have to ring that bell across the river and then they'll have to go get him so he's like you know we don't need to worry about hank catching us however hank ends up swimming (laughs) across the river which this is talked about in the book how someone says like oh i'll swim across the river and they're like nobody can swim across except Hank. So again, Hank is just very impressive and larger than life. Anyway, Lee hears Hank in the room beside them. And so he knows Hank is aware of what's happening and can hear them. I guess Viv couldn't apparently, but Lee takes advantage of that moment, moment and he tells Viv that he loves her and he gets her to say it back as a way to really crush Hank hearing that Viv loves Lee. And this part was just so messed up of Lee to use Viv in that way and manipulate her as a pawn in this game he has with Hank. But anyway, at some point, Hank goes into the bathroom and Viv here. So she gets dressed and goes to see Hank. And then Lee walks in and he has this line prepared, this smug line. However, he isn't able to say the line because then he hears the news that Joby has died and that Henry is in the hospital. And like I said in the movie, we don't see them having sex and Hank doesn't catch them, but it is implied. But it like, it's messed up though because Lee knows that Joe Ben is probably going to die and he knows that Henry is in the hospital not doing well and yet he still chooses to go through with it. Granted, Viv is planning on leaving anyway, but it seemed much more heartless in that sense. And then, yeah, Viv is gone and we never see her again after that. Whereas in the book, Viv stays with Hank because like I said, she sees Hank when he gets back and hears about what happened. And she does love Hank. And she's like, you know, I can't leave him when he's so depressed and going through all of this. And with Viv in the movie, she did come across more as like the oppressed woman who has no voice in this household of men. And she never speaks her own opinion because she feels like even if she tries to, she won't be listened to. And so when Lee shows up and he takes an interest in her and he asks her question, questions and he listens to her and he says thank you when she serves him food and so he's just so different from all the other men in the house that of course she takes an interest and he's doing it. Like I said, in some ways, maybe he fell in love with her to some extent, but he's also just being manipulative. But in the book, Viv is unhappy with like just where her life has ended up. And in both book and movie, we do hear that she had had, uh, she had been pregnant at one point, but lost the baby. So that has contributed to her sadness. And the movie does do a good job of telling us the backstory of how she met Hank through the conversation she has with Lee. Whereas in the book, we hear it through a flashback. But in the book, Viv, even though like she wasn't the happiest character, she was just much more witty and fun than she was in the movie. Like she and Hank just have a more fun, playful relationship. And then she and Lee just have this witty banter that was missing from the movie with both people. And in the book, like I said, she doesn't talk about leaving Hank. Like Lee will try to convince her to go with him, but she is never convinced. And she's always like, no, like I can't leave Hank. And in the book, after they have sex, Lee leaves and he goes to stay at a hotel for a few days. And so the house is empty and it's just Viv and Hank and like their interactions just aren't the same. And Hank thinks of, you know, how quiet it is and how he misses having everybody in the house and how his interactions interactions with Viv just aren't the same. And so he thinks how, you know, like he's got to hand it to Lee because he really did mess up the relationship. And then Lee shows up at the house because he is getting insurance papers. And then while he is there, he has time alone with Viv and he once again convinces her, tries to convince her to come away with him. And he's like, you know, you might love, you might love both of us, but I need you more. So come with me. But she tells him no. And then Hank gets to take him in the boat across the river. And once they're across the river, Lee sees that Viv is looking through the window at them, but Hank can't tell this. And so Lee says stuff to egg Hank on because he wants Hank to hit him. And then Lee is planning on not fighting back. And so he thinks Viv will see what a terrible guy Hank is and it will make her want to be with Lee. And it works because Hank does hit Lee. However, Lee ends up fighting back and both of them just get in this, you know, pretty serious fight. And then at one point they decide that they have both had enough. And like I said, this fight helps awake Hank from the stupor he had been in. And then it also gives Lee a new confidence. And so then they 
part ways feeling better about things. But later when Hank decides to run the logs with the WB con WP contract after all, Viv goes into town to tell Lee about this and Lee ends up leaving to go join Hank and Viv is there and she's just thinking about her life and how it didn't go the way she had planned and she's thinking about all the children she had wanted and how she had wanted to marry a man that would be okay with her cutting her hair because her dad never let her cut her hair or her uncle. And then when she mentioned cutting her hair early on when meeting Hank, he was like, what? No, never cut your hair. You can't have it short. So basically, I guess symbolizing the fact that she has never been able to be her true self and so she decides to take, take Lee's bus ticket he had bought and she is going to leave, get it on a train, get on a bus and get out of there. But before she does, she cuts her hair and then she leaves and that's that. <laughs> which I did like this ending for Viv in the book. I was a little worried she would end up committing suicide, which I didn't feel would have been the right choice for her. And Kesey didn't think so either because he has her just leave town instead, which I liked. And again, in the movie, she leaves town as well, but it happens sooner. Okay, so moving on to the strike, which I, I try to make this an organized video, but there really is just so much to cover. So I hope I'm ma not making it too confusing. But anyway, I separated out to like the family drama, which I just talked about. And now we're moving on to the details of the strike. So like I said, the union company went on strike against Wakanda Pacific, not filling their contract, but then the stampers just took up the contract instead. And so the strike is doing nothing because WP is still getting what they want through the stampers. And as said, the whole town is against the stampers, but Hank just doesn't seem to care what his actions are doing to the town. And again, they live so separated from the town, whereas the other stamper people, they're in the town and they talk about how their kids are bullied at school and all this stuff. And they're like, Hank, you don't understand because you're so separated, but it's hard over here. And so that's why a lot of the stampers stop showing up, which we will get into. But yeah, Hank just doesn't seem to care and neither does Henry. And then Joby, he is just, because he continues working too and he's not bothered, but he just has a whole different way of looking at it. So Floyd Evenwright lives in town and he works for this company and he tries to take things into his own hands and he tries to sabotage the Stamper company in different ways, burning equipment or trying to set loose some of their logs. However, like nothing really takes and the Stampers are able to just continue doing their business. And Jonathan Drager, he just kind of lets Floyd do this knowing it won't work. And then it's not till later where Drager and Floyd even right are in a bar and Drager says, you know, like, you know, we have enough money to buy Stamper out so we can buy his company and then we can like get what we want. And then they leave the bar to go talk to Hank. However, they don't actually go talk to Hank because they don't, they don't want to make the offer. They just want people to spread the rumor that they are buying out the Stamper company. And the other Stamper relatives inevitably hear this rumor. And so they are all so excited because now they're gonna get a cut when the company is bought out plus the town will no longer hate them. However, when the family, they have this meeting and all the family members are like, oh, like you're buying the company out, right? And Hank tells them, no, like that's not what's happening. And they are also disappointed. And this is what really like, you know, the straw that makes the, breaks the camel's back when it comes to a lot of the Stamper people and slowly but surely each one of them stops, stops showing up to work aside from Andy and Joby and Lee. And we do have Jonathan Drager and Floyd even right in the movie. But Jonathan Drager doesn't really do that much. We see him in the beginning scene, which there's a scene in both book and movie where Floyd and uh, Jonathan Drager go talk to Hank out on Hank's property and try to convince him to stop. And that's when he says the whole thing about how, you know, he's only on his own side. And this is at the beginning of the movie. However, it doesn't take place till like the middle of the book. So we have him there in the movie, but for the most part, Drager just doesn't do much. And we have Floyd even right is like a bigger role. But yeah, there's just more to that in the book. And again, in the movie, we don't have Drager and Floyd even right making people think they're gonna buy Stamper out, which ends up making the Stampers stop showing up to work because they're so disappointed. In the movie, they just stop showing up because they're just tired of the town hating them. And then in book and movie, we have the character of Willard, who is a very important character. He is the one that owns the theater as well as a dry cleaning company. And most people think of him as just being a very spineless person. But we find out that he had had an affair with a woman that had worked there and then she had a baby and she moved to Seattle. And so she and this baby are in Seattle and it's a boy, so he has a son and he has been sending them money to help support them. However, due to the strike, the people in town don't have money to spend on movie theaters and dry cleaning. And so he does not have enough money to send to his, this woman and his son. He is married and has a wife in town. However, he doesn't love his wife and they don't have a great relationship. So this woman in Seattle and her son are the people 
that he really cares about and wants to help. And so he sets up a will so that when he dies, all of his money will go to her because she tells him that since he isn't sending money, she's gonna have to get married because she needs to be able to support her and her son somehow. And so that's when he's like, wait, no, don't get married. I have a plan, like you won't have to get married. And so he leaves everything to her in his will and he is going to commit suicide, but he's going to make it look like an accident. However, before he goes through with this, he like wants to tell someone. And so he decides to tell Hank since Hank is like the cause of all of this. And so in the book, like I said, they have been getting calls at their house constantly. And Willard decides to call at like 1230 in the morning and Hank answers and he's tired and he's just been used to dealing with rude people all day long. And so when Willard is telling him about his plans, Hank just tells him like, good luck. And Willard says like, you don't believe me? And Hank says, I believe you. I'm just feeling really out of it right now. So good luck is about all I can give you. And then this is basically the end of their conversation. And then Floyd, sorry, Willard later that night gets in a car accident and dies. And then the next morning at dinner, they hear about his death and Hank is definitely rattled by this, but he is the only one who knows because that's when the phone call comes back to his memory and he realizes that this wasn't an accident. In the movie, we have the same stuff happens with Willard. However, when he tells Hank about this, he tells it to him when Hank is in town and so it's face to face. However, the interaction goes basically the same where Hank tells him good luck and how that's the best he can offer right now because he's just mentally so stressed with everything else. Also in the movie, Viv is with him. So Viv hears what Willard tells her, tells him. And then the next morning when they hear that Willard has died, Viv and Hank have this moment where they realize what happened. And she goes and she tries to get him to stop working. And she's like, look what's happening because of this. You need to just stop. But Hank doesn't want to, Henry doesn't want to stop. And so they just keep going on. And that was not in the book. Like Viv didn't try to get them to stop. There is a part where she talks about how early on in the book, she doesn't like going into town and dealing with the woman because they all are resentful over her because her family continues to work. And so she didn't like that, but she never like tried to get Hank to stop. And also the reason Hank was in town in the movie was because he was getting his saw fixed and earlier, like the previous day, even Wright had like messed up their equipment. And so when he's in town fixing his saw, he walks past the union office and see, sees Floyd's desk and he goes in and saws the desk in half, which was a great scene. And then it's right after this that Willard walks up and talks to him. And so Hank experiences a number of difficult things all in a row. So he gets beaten up in town, although he beats the other guy up worse, but still he gets beaten up in town and then his own family no longer supports him and they stop showing up to work. And then we have the death of Willard and then we have the death of Joe Ben and then we have Henry who loses his arm Arm. And then he's once again beat up and then he comes home and he sees slash hears Viv and Lee having sex. And so all of this just really wears him down and he becomes very depressed and he's just in this fog and not processing things clearly. And he's also just so tired of being the enemy of the town. And so he decides to not fulfill the WP contract. And in the movie, we also have Henry who died plus Viv left. So those are more things that added on to his depressed state. And we see him just at home drinking beer. And then a few days after, you know, after Joe Ben's death, when Hank has stopped filling the contract and he's just in this haze, Lee, who has been living in town, goes to the doctor to see Henry and he sees that Henry is not doing well and is about to die. And so the doctor tells him like, if you get the life insurance papers, you can get some money for this. So go to Hank's house and you can get those papers. And while they're talking to him, they're being very condescending towards Hank being like, oh, I hope he's doing okay and he needs all the help we, he can get and we're gonna send him free food. And uh, the grocery store had stopped delivering to him and they claimed it was like they had some reason why they couldn't, but really they stopped delivering because they were mad at him. So the grocery guy is like, oh, and we can deliver groceries again too. So tell Hank to put the signs up that way we know what to bring him because they have this system where he'll put different flags up and that's how the grocery people know what to send over. And so they're just being very condescending and being helpful, but in a condescending way because they got what they wanted, you know, because Hank is just so deflated and they're happy about it. And so Lee goes to the house to get the papers. We have the whole thing with Viv. He tries to get her to come with him. She says no. And then he gets Hank to beat him up. And the reason he gets Hank to beat him up is because he's telling Hank what they had told him in town, being very condescending. And this gets to Hank obviously, and they get in a fight. And then this fight just awakes him all over again. And he decides that he is going to fulfill the WB contract and forget the town and their condescending ways. And he's going through with this. However, he doesn't tell this to Lee, like he goes back home. And then that's when he like calls to rent the tugboat and everything. And then he tells 
Viv, and then Viv goes into town to tell Lee. And at this time, Lee is looking through the box that has the insurance papers. And in the box, he also sees that there were letters that his mom had written to Hank. And so seeing these letters, just even though they got in this fight, that was very cleansing. Seeing all these letters just brings all the emotion back up again. And he's angry at Hank all over again. And then Viv comes and tells him that Hank is gonna run the logs by himself. And Lee is so annoyed and he's like, you know, Hank just is always trying to be the hero, which granted the town doesn't see him as a hero, but running the logs by himself is very impressive. And so he's like, here's Hank doing this impressive thing yet again. And he's like, I'm not gonna let him get away with it. I'm gonna go with him and help him. That way he can't take all the credit. And so he leaves Viv and he goes to help Hank run the logs, which is funny because it's not like he's doing it out of love or loyalty, he's doing it more out of like vengeance and because of this tug of war he has with Hank. But yeah, so then he goes to help Hank run the logs. And I talked about how the guy said, you know, make sure you put the different signals up so we know what to get you. Uh, Henry had lost his arm, if you remember, and they still had it, they had kept it in the freezer. And so Hank takes it out, he makes it so the middle finger is flipping up and he sets that out for people to see. And so when they try to see what's going on at the Stamper home, they see that they are being flipped off. And then as I said, from here, Viv ends up leaving town and the book ends with, you know, Hank running the logs and Viv leaving town. But anyway, in the movie, it's a little different because so Viv has left, Hank is depressed, and then Lee is just hanging out across the river for some reason. So he's just over that way. And then Hank gets a phone call from the townspeople, again, being very condescending, offering their help and being very smug. And that's when Hank is like, wait a minute, like, I'm not, what am I doing? And so he goes out there to prepare to run the logs and Lee sees what's happening. And so he comes over and the two of them get ready to run the logs together. And so as they're doing this, the townspeople come around and they see and they're watching. And then Hank sees that they're watching. And so he goes to grab Henry's arm, has it flip them off and puts it on the tugboat. And so the book and movie endings, they're basically the same, like the same thing happens where Hank makes the comeback, surprising the town and showing them that he's still got it. And I love that both of them use Henry's arm to flip them off. I thought in the movie they wouldn't do that, but I was very happy to see that they did. And I don't know how you could watch that scene in the movie and not be grinning because it is just such a great moment. And it's a great moment too in the book. Like in the movie, Lee helps him out. It seems more of like him putting forth an olive branch of them, you know, bonding together once more, or maybe not once more, but maybe for the first time ever, really. But I like that in the book, he's not doing it as an olive branch. He's doing it like out of spite. <laughs> And it was very fitting in the book, but I also liked it in the movie as well. So it kind of works out both ways. And like I said, it both, both of them are achieving the same end goal with the endings. But the very end of the book, so like I said, there are a number of characters in this book, a lot of which are not in the movie, but one of them I wanted to talk about is a woman named Jenny, and she is a Native American woman who is a female prostitute, and we hear her perspective a lot. And we hear a story about how Henry had insulted her, and so she has this like hate slash obsession with Henry. And then near the end of the book, we see her like throwing shells and doing some kind of like magical spell. And then when we return to her again, and the shells are looking like a face, and then when we return to her again, we see that there is a man there and she's talking to this man, telling him her real name. And then the book ends. And I, I'm mentioning this because I didn't understand it. I don't understand the symbolism of that moment and who this guy was. And it was near the death of Henry. So does this guy have to do with Henry? Cause she did have this weird thing with him. So I don't know anyone who has read the book, if you know what the symbolism of the end of the book with Jenny was, I would love to hear your thoughts. This has been another longer video, but, but to mention some other changes real quick. So in the movie, we see them going to this like lumberjack picnic where they play football and there's that motorcycle race. And that was not in the book. Also in the book, Joby's face was like all scarred up. I forget what had happened to him, but he had this messed up looking face. That was not the case in the movie. He just had a normal good looking face. And there is a scene after the lumberjack picnic in the movie when Hank gets drunk and Newman plays a really good drunk guy. So I was impressed. And then the music in the movie is done by Harry Man Mancini, Mancini. And it was like more uh, like playful and lively at times than I had expected. However, I did like it. So I enjoyed the soundtrack. And then also when Lee is on the East Coast, we see how he like has schizophrenia due to like drug use, it sounds like, and how he talks about he had been to a therapist and he told the therapist that like he thinks he's going mad, he's going crazy. And the therapist tells him, no, Leland, not you. You and in fact, quite a lot of your generation have in some way been exiled from that particular sanctuary. It's become almost impossible for you to go mad in the classical sense. You are too hip to yourself on a psychological level. You are all too intimate with too many of the symptoms of insanity 
humanity to be caught completely off your guard. Another thing, all of you have a talent for releasing frustration through clever fantasy. And you, you are the worst of the lot on that score. So you may be neurotic as hell for the rest of your life and miserable but I'm afraid never never completely out. <laughs> so that just gives you a look into the way Leland is, is how he feels unstable and neurotic and miserable, but he will never have like the sanctuary of total insanity because he's just too aware. So I thought that was an interesting line. And then to wrap this up, book first movie. <laughs> So I love this movie and I think someone going into it who hasn't read the book, I think they would really enjoy it and probably wouldn't have too many complaints, I wouldn't think. When you compare it to the book, there is so much that is left out that is in the book and the book just really is this like family epic where the movie just isn't quite that. And so of course I do think the book wins. However, I do think this is a decent adaptation, especially like I said, they condensed 650 pages into a movie that is like an hour and 54, 54 minutes long. <laughs> so I thought they did a decent job. I love the performances and it was filmed in Oregon and I love the scenery and just, they really brought the story to life, I thought. Even if they did miss a lot of details, and skipped out on a lot of characters. And honestly, I don't mind that. Like I kind of prefer when a book is adapted into a movie rather than a TV show. Like I get a TV show can include all of the details or at least so many more of the details, but sometimes I don't need that. <laughs> like for an adaptation, I'm fine with them leaving out some details. So I kind of prefer when it's adapted to a movie rather than a TV show, which by the way, I have never done a book verse TV show on why the book wins and it's because TV shows just demand so much time and that is a huge reason why I just don't cover them. And yeah, ultimately I just prefer the movies and they just condense it and trim it down and I don't mind that. I mean, I love all the details you get from a book, but they're just two different mediums, you know? So a book, it works better to get all these details, whereas with a movie, it's just not necessary. And yeah, again, performances are amazing, specifically Henry Fonda and of course, Paul Newman, who I love. I've covered Cool Hand Luke, The Hustler, HUD, and now sometimes a great notion and he is always amazing. And ultimately I would highly recommend both book and movie. Again, the audiobook is fantastic, but it's also one that's worth physically reading. And yeah, I loved it so much. Five stars, glowing five stars. The movie I think would be a five star too, maybe four and a half stars. So the book definitely wins, but I really love the movie as well. So that wraps it up today for sometimes a great notion. Let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you for watching or listening. If you are listening to this as a podcast, I would love it if you give me a rating and review. It would mean so, so much to me. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and I will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye.